All right, let's start. So I'm going to talk about the Turing machine today. Um, when I was back at university studying computer science, I know we, uh, at least during some course, talked briefly about uh, that machine, but I honestly don't remember much of that. Perhaps I was not listening enough or I wasn't able to, to understand it. Um, but I do remember that it involved something about an infinite tape, which I found rather freakish at the time. Um, but a couple of years ago, I read a book on this topic, and what I found was a story that I thought was pretty amazing. And that is a story I'm going to tell today. So this is going to be a storytelling time. And I'm going to talk about the actual proof that Alan Turing did with his uh, Turing machine. But more importantly, I'm going to talk about why he did that proof, what he wanted to achieve, and what the cons consequences of that were. So, story starts here. Paris, the year 1900. So during this time, the state-of-the-art technology was steam engines, right? Trains, telegraph, and things like that. Turn of the century, and there was a big uh, mathematical conference in Paris at this time, where the uh, uh, most famous mathematicians of the time were gathering to talk about the mathematics. And one of the people present there was this person, David Hilbert. Any of you heard about him before? A couple of you, okay, good. So he was one of the most prominent mathematicians during this era. Uh, he's a professor at, um, uh, at Göttingen, a university in, uh, in Germany. Quite a small town, but a very famous university from there. Uh, and he was given the honor of giving the keynote speech at this uh, conference. And he gave a speech with this title. I'm not very good at French, so I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Uh, but it basically has the title that uh, Future Problems in Mathematics. And he did something rather bold in this keynote speech. And that was, this was the turn of the century. So he wanted to do something really epic about this. So he gave a talk where he put forth his own philosophy regarding what mathematics is and what mathematics should be as a field of research for the coming 100 years. And one of the most famous things from this speech is that he lists a number of problems that is now known as the Hilbert problems. There was actually 23 problems that are listed that he said these are the most important remaining mathematical questions that we as mathematicians and as a human race actually should try to solve and, and, uh, and figure out. Some of those problems are still not solved. And if you want to be famous in mathematics, you should look into those because those are uh, uh, very legendary there. But anyway, part of this was also based on his philosophy of what being a mathematician is and what mathematics is. And he had the idea that mathematical problems are logical riddles, and that any mathematical problem that we try to put our hands on, we as a human race can solve those, as long as we put our effort into it and put our minds together to do this. And that was the role of mathematics. He himself was very deeply involved in, 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 a, in a project that went even deeper than this, which is uh, known as the, the Hilbert program. And his thought was that since all these problems are problems that we can solve uh, to, as a human race, it should be possible to define a semantics of what mathematics really is so that we can automate that process. And this Hilbert program was a quest for finding these rigorous foundations of the lowest level of what mathematics is so we can build the system. And this quest consists of finding three things, three components. First was formalism. This is basically a language, a set of axioms, or atoms, if you would like to call it, and the rules for how to deal with this. This is basically something similar to what we're doing today in physics when we try to find sort of the elementary particles in physics. They were trying to do the same with mathematics. What are the fundamental building blocks in mathematics from which you can build all other mathematical ideas? And if we had this and a proof stating that these are indeed everything we need to define mathematics, then it might be possible to develop an algorithm that takes all these axioms, all the rules on how to deal with them, and a mathematical problem, and then automatically goes through all these rules and all these axioms and figure out whether or not that property is true or false. Having such uh, an algorithm would be an amazing intellectual breaker for the human race, because we had sort of solved mathematics if you had all of this. In theory, we could pass any mathematical to some sort of machine, let's call it a computer, and we could figure out whether or not that, that, um, that hypothesis is true or false. And this was a big area of research in mathematics during the early parts of the 19th century. Uh, a lot of people were basing their whole careers in this. 
One of the most notable examples of this is what is called um, a work called Principia Mathematica, which was a big um, three-volume work by two mathematicians, uh, Whitehead and Bertrand Russell, uh, where they attempted to do this, define those fundamental parts of, uh, of algebra so that you can prove any property within algebra. This is a small excerpt taken from Wikipedia from their work, and this is a proof that shows that 1 plus 1 equals 2. It's at that level they're doing their work. So they have been defining these small atoms, and from those they have been able to derive a very fundamental part of algebra. This is obviously sort of comical, but it's also very useful, right? <laughs> and also they added this note that the above proposition is, is occasionally useful. So, obviously. So this was work that was going on for long. I think they spent 10 years putting together this work. Uh, and there was a lot of research uh, done in, the, in this area. Um, and there was also work done by, um, by, by uh, Hilbert himself uh, on uh, doing something similar for uh, geometry. Uh, so there was a lot of progress in defining this formalism to describe all mathematics, but this decision problem was not really good attacked. So this was the problem where you would find an algorithm that would take this formalism, formalism and all those rules and use those to solve real mathematical problems. Uh, Hilbert himself, uh, Hilbert himself uh, um, releases a book uh, called Principles of Mathematical Logic uh, together with another uh, mathematician in 1928 where he uh, does a lot of work in this area and he is able to show algorithms for solving big classes of mathematical problems based on this. So also here there's a lot of progress being done but they're not able to get it all the way. And he notes also in this that the decision problem must be considered um, one of the main problem mathematical logic today. So this is a very important part of his quest for this, uh, this full understanding of mathematics. And Hilbert retires not too long after, 1930. At this point, he's 60, 68 years old. And he's uh, at a dinner where they are sort of celebrating his, uh, his, his career and what he has achieved. And during this part, he holds a talk with the title Logic and the Knowledge of Nature. And here again, he states his um, philosophy about mathematics, the way how we as humans should strive to, to gain knowledge here and how we can solve these problems if we only put our minds to it. And in this talk, he adds a quote that has been quite famously coupled with him, which is, wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. And for those of you who don't know German, that means uh, we must know, we will know, which sort of sums up his whole idea about how to deal with mathematics. We can do this if we just put our minds to it. The year after he goes, um, he retires, this person comes to the scene, Kurt Gödel. How many here knows him? A couple of you, good. This is a very, very strange fellow, a uh, very special guy. He uh, had some social difficulties in uh, many aspects. He later became a very good friend of Albert Einstein, by the way. That's an cu interesting, curious thing. He was born in Austria-Hungary, 1908, in what is now the Czech Republic. And the year after Hilbert retired, 1931, he published a paper with the tongue twister title on formally undecidable propositions of Principia Mathematica and related system one. He was supposed to uh, have a follow-up on this where he would uh, go deeper into the subject, uh, but he never released that. In this paper, he describes what is now known as Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And he is basically able to prove that any system of formalism, like the one that, um, um, uh, that we saw in Principia Mathematica, uh, there will always be mathematical problems that are unsolvable within that system. So he is able to prove that what Hilbert is trying to achieve with his program is impossible. And this was a real earthquake within mathematics at the time, because this was a very, very surprising result. Nobody expected this. And Hilbert himself, when he heard about it, they said that he became very, very angry <laughs> because this turned everything on its head. And I mean, the work that they had been doing with Principia Mathematica, that was almost a complete, complete waste. Of course, they learned stuff on the way, but they never would have gone into that project for 10 years if they knew that what they were trying to achieve was impossible. So this was a very, very big thing. Um, but it wasn't the, uh, the end of the story. Because what he showed was that, it was that there will always be properties uh, or mathematical problems that were unsolvable, 
but they did not say anything about whether or not it's possible to figure out if a problem is, um, um, is, is solvable or not. He, could only, he only specified that it's impossible to, to solve it, not whether or not it is solvable. And this was sort of a sub-problem that then became known as the end childings problem. And this is where Turing comes in. So Turing was born in London, 1912. He went to Cambridge, the King's College there. And in 1935, he read a course with the title of Foundations of Mathematics, where, among other things, Gödel's incompleteness theorem was covered. So this is just four years after that paper was launched. So this paper had already become a very prominent part of mathematics at the time. It was quite obvious that this was an important finding. And in this course, they also talk about this Entscheidungs problem. And here, they describe the problem like this. Is there a mechanical process which can be applied to a mathematical statement and which will come up with the answer as to whether it is provable? So it's not to come up with the answer whether or not it's true or false, because God has shown that that was impossible, but this was to show whether or not it is possible to decide whether it's true or false. And this must have set Turing's imagination going, especially his first part around mechanical process, because he starts thinking about what, what kind of machine would this be? What kind of process would that be? And what could it do? And more importantly, what could it not do? And this is where the Turing machine is born. So, Turing delivers a paper, this is the year after, in 1936, with the title On Computable Numbers, we'll come back to that part, Computable Numbers with an Application to the Entscheidungs Problem. In this paper, he describes a fictive machine, so this is important to keep in mind, he never had the intention of actually building this, this was sort of a thought experiment about what such a machine would be like. But the machine consists of three parts. First is a finite state machine, does everybody here know what a state machine is? If, yeah, if you don't, then there will be a lot of examples, so I'll show you what that is. But it's important that it's finite. In mathematics, you can have infinite state machines, uh, but he's looking at finite state machines. Second thing is an infinite tape. This is the thing that I remember from school. So this is a tape that stretches infinitely in both directions. And finally, there's a head that can move along this tape and read and write symbols. So those are the three components on the machine, and what they will use this machine for is to, to um, uh, compute numbers. This machine is capable of producing computable numbers, as they call them. So, let's have a look at one of the examples that he includes in his paper as well. So this is the first machine we'll be looking at, and I'll explain a little what we're seeing here. First of all, there are two main sections, one to the left here, which is the configuration, and one to the right, which is the behavior. And configuration is basically a definition of the state that this machine is at the moment, which again consists of two things. First is a state name, so it's a symbol. Don't want to fall off the stage here. So a symbol here, which is B in the beginning, and then a symbol, which is a symbol that is underneath the head of the machine right now. And if you have this combination, then you're supposed to follow the operations in the operations column. P stands for print. This means that it will print a zero and then move one step to the right, R for right, and then the final, final section is the next state you will be in. So if you execute this machine, it would look something like this. We start off here, B is probably from beginning. He never gives any uh, reasons for why he chose the, uh, the naming, names he used, uh, but we can uh, figure out that it's, uh, we can guess that it's supposed to be beginning. So we start off in the state B. The head is here, looking at this square, there is no symbol there, which means that we are matching on the first row. That means that we were printing a zero and move one step to the right. Then we go to the next state, which is C. And here there is no symbol, so we just move to the right. Then we go to the next state, which is E. At E, we will print a one, then we move to the right. And then we go to F, which moves to the right. And then it goes back to the beginning. So we have a loop here. So this machine will be able to just produce these digits over and over and over again. So we can produce 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so on. So now we are producing digits, but we are going to turn this into a number. So how do we do that? Well, we take all these digits on the tape, just put them down like this, and we add 0 dot, 0 dot in front of it. Now we have a number. 
This is a number with an infinite number of digits after the, uh, the, um, the decimal separator. And if you read this as a binary number, does anyone here know what number this is? We're not really used to reading uh, fractional binary numbers, but this is the number one third represented binary. So this machine that we see here is a machine that is capable of computing the digits of the binary number one third. It's a quite simple machine, and the reason why it's simple is that we have this repeatable sequence here. So we can just have a loop that goes through all those digits and just print them and, uh, and then goes back to the beginning. Turing is never concerned about uh, numbers that are larger than zero. He only looks at numbers between zero and one. And the reason that for every, uh, every number that is larger than zero, there will always be just a finite number of digits. So if we were to produce a number like three and a third, well, then we could just add two states where we print uh, two ones. And then we're back into the loop. So we don't have to care about that. We can always extend it with a finite number of, um, of states. Another interesting thing is that using this process, we can produce any number that has a repeatable sequence of digits in it. Digits in it. And any number that has a repeatable sequence is a rational number. So a rational number is a number where you can, we take two integers and divide them. That is a rational number. Any rational number will have this type of repeatable sequence. So that means that this, this machine, this type of machine, could produce any rational number. So what about the irrational numbers? Because there are numbers out there that are not rational, right? An example of an irrational number? Pi, good one. Square root of 2, e, there's a lot of those. And we use them in mathematics all the time. So how would you deal with such a number? Well. Next number he goes to is this one. This is a quite odd number, but he uses it because it's a convenient way of illustrating how his machine works. So you can see the pattern here. It's 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. For each cycle here, it's incrementing the number of ones with 1. And it's quite obvious to see that this will never have a repeating sequence because we're always adding one more. So how do we define a machine for dealing with this number? Well. He goes through this in detail in his paper, and the end result looks like this. I'm going to go through this and, and tell you what this means. It's an interesting technique he uses to solve this. Uh, but first of all, I can just mention that he has made some extensions to the sort of language he uses in this table. First of all, he allows there to be multiple operations in his, each sequence. So the operations within a certain behavior is, uh, it can be extended. It's just a simplification. And it's important that it's a simplification because we could have just extended the number of states and printed each and every symbol if we would like, but we don't have to do with this, this optimized version of writing the table. He also allows for sim multiple symbols at the same row. So in this case, we are comparing if there's any symbol there, a zero or a one, then we do something. If it's not, then we do something else. All right, so let's go through this machine and look at what it does. First part here is just some initialization stage. We start up off at the B state, as we do in its machines. And what it does is prints two of these stop signs. We will see later on why, why there are stop signs. But he, he uses that to mark the start of his calculations. Then he prints two zeros and moves uh, two to the left. So after this is done, we will have our head standing there. And we are going to O. Actually, he doesn't use this stop sign in his paper. He uses a weird character called schwa. I never figured out really where it comes from, but it's, uh, I think this is more clear and easy to write on a, on a PowerPoint. So anyway, now we're in the state O. So now we look, what is the symbol under the head? It's a zero, so we follow this line, at which case we just go to Q. So we go here, and again we look at the state. What is the symbol? It's a zero, so we're at the top row. So we just move two to the right go back to Q. Again, there's a zero there, so we go two to the right. Now there's no symbol. So now we hit the lower row, where we print a one, and move one step to the left. So then we go to the next state, Q, next state, P. At this point, again, we have to pattern match with the symbol. There is no symbol here, so you move two to the left, you go back to P. Again, no symbol, two to the left, and we reach the stop sign. This is where we use a stop sign. It uses that to just rewind the head across the tape until it reaches one of these signs. 
So we have the stop sign, we move one step to the right and go to F. And what do we do here? Well, as long as there's any symbol under the head, we move two to the right and back to the same. So there's a zero here, so you move there, then you move here, and finally move there, and now there's no symbol, at which point you print a zero and move two to the left. And then we go back to O, which was an earlier state. So this finished one cycle of this machine uh, and how it operates. And after each cycle, we are always at the second last digit in this machine. Now, we haven't shown what the X is for yet, and that's what I'm going to show you now. But to do that, I'll just skip one more cycle into the whole uh, calculations, which, at which point it will look like this. We now have two ones. And we start up at the first row, state O. There's a one here, so we go to the right, print an X, and then move three to the left. We go back to O and do the same thing here. There's a one there, so we move to the right, print an X, and move three to the left. And now there's a zero there instead, so we go to Q. So what has happened here is that the machine has tagged the last sequence of ones with an X after it. And we'll see how we use that later on. So at this point, there's a zero, so we go to the right. We just go to the right as long as there is a number there. So we go to the right, right, right. Now there is no symbol, so we print the one and move to the left. Next state is P, and there is no symbol under the head, so we go two steps to the left. Now there's an X there. What we do then is that we do an erase operation. So E is for erase. It deletes that X, moves one step to the right, and then it goes back to Q. And what Q did was that it scans along the number to the end of the calculations and prints a one. You see what it did? It basically moves across the tape until it finds an X, picks that one up, and turns it into a one at the end. As is, we always start by printing one, one digit of one at the beginning. We know that there will always be one more than the last time we did this loop. And that way, he's able to construct this uh, irrational number. And if you look at this table, we can see that each of these lines has a specific purpose, a sort of a sub-procedure, we will call it them when we are doing programming, right? First one is an initialization state. Second part here, the second state, is where we tag the ones of the previous cycle of, uh, previous oper cycle of operations. Then we print a one at the end, and we skip back and forth these two, where we pick up the x's and move back to, uh, to printing ones, and converge those x's into ones. And then finally, this one, is a state that ensures that we print a zero as a separator between these two cycles. <clears throat> now, in his paper now, Turing uh, gives a lot of examples of different uh, constructs you can do. And he goes through uh, some uh, effort to show how you could build things like uh, a small uh, subroutine for uh, copying a certain sequence or for uh, comparing sequence or doing all these type of low-level operations. Uh, and he used some extended abstractions on top of this table to do that. But it's always very important for him to show that it's possible to go back to that original type of table where you, in each row here, have exactly one symbol, one operation, or actually one printing and one uh, move, and you end up in a state. And he shows that it's possible to have all these tables, all rows of a table, fit into a very small pattern. It can fit into one of these three types of rows. So what we do here is that we have a certain symbol, or a certain state, which we now denote qi, just for an, for an index there. We have a certain symbol, and then we print a certain symbol as well. And then the following thing is that we move in a certain direction. So all these different types of rows are identical apart from the, the way the head moves. And if we use this type of annotation for the tables, then we could um, define the table we had where we produced the one-third number. We could define it like this. Now we can just say that S0, that's the symbol one, zero, S1 is a symbol one, S2 is a symbol blank. So we actually print blank. 
Because then we could define our table like this. Start off in Q0. There is no symbol beneath it, it's blank. So we print a zero and move to the right. What do we do here? Well, there is no symbol there, it's blank. So we print a blank and move to the right. So you have a way of expressing these tables in a very simplistic manner. And the reason he wants to do this is he wants to have a way to serialize these tables. You want to be able to write them down in a well-defined way. And if you have this type of table, you can just take each row as they are, concatenate them, and put them in a row like this with a semicolon as a separator. So this is the way that Turing shows that you can take one of these tables and serialize them, write them down. This, with this, we can see that every single subsection of this serialized table will contain this piece. We can just remove that. That is no longer needed. So that's a way to simplify it. And then finally, what it does is that it takes all these indexes. So we have 0, 2, 1, and so on in this. And instead of having that index, we will just replace those indexes with a sequence of A's that are along as a number. So number 0 will be replaced by 0 A's. Number 3 will be replaced by 3 A's. And if we do that, then this sequence could be written like this. And this format is what he calls the standard description. So this is a standard description of all those tables that he can show that it's possible to build. Now, all of this effort is to show that there is a simple way to write down the description of one of these machines that he is expressing, one of these state machines. And where do you think he wants to write this down? Any suggestions? Where? On the tape, exactly. So the next thing he does is that he shows that if we write this down on the tape, it is possible to construct a machine that takes this input and executes that machine. He calls this the universal machine, and the idea is that this can take any definition of any table and produce those numbers defined by that, by that sequence. This is Alan Turing inventing the program on the computer. This is what we do today when you write our programs. We write down those instructions, which is exactly what he suggests here. He obviously didn't know what the consequences of that would be at the time. He was trying to do something completely different, but, um, but it's very interesting to see him doing that here. Because inventing the computer was not the goal he had. That was sort of a side effect of all he did there. Because now we are approaching some of the interesting parts within this. And that is, he will take this sequence here, this standard description, and he will do a transformation of this. So let's take those seven digits. This consists of only seven different uh, uh, characters, the whole description. Q, S, A, R, L, N, and semicolon. Let's take those characters, replace them by a digit instead. So take all the A's, or take all the Q's, replace them by ones, all the S's, replace them by twos. If we do that, then we end up with this number. That's a pretty big number, but it is a number. And why is that important? What's so special about numbers? We can count them. One, two, three, four. And what he has shown here is that all those machines that, can be, that he can describe with the state machines, they are enumerable. I can start counting one, two, three, four, five, and eventually I will reach uh, a state machine, a, a number that corresponds to one of these machines. In fact, if I just count long enough, I can reach any such machine. And he has shown that it is possible to construct this, um, this universal machine, so I will eventually reach that machine as well. Or the machine that computes pi, or the square root of two. Any machine, as long as I count long enough. Now we're going to turn a little to, to numbers and some of the mathematics behind this. So he says that in his paper, the computable numbers may be described briefly as the real numbers whose expressions as a decimal are calculated by a finite means. 
So we're going to look a little about those families of numbers that we have. First of all, we have the integers, right? The whole numbers, those are pretty basic. Then we have the rationals, which we talked briefly about earlier, which are, can be defined as any number that can be expressed as the uh, a fraction of two integers. Then we have the irrational numbers, which are all the other numbers. And the combination of the rational numbers and the irrational numbers, those are the real numbers. Those are all the numbers there are. Now, Turing introduces a new class of numbers. And these are the computable numbers. And he says that, according to my definition, a number is computable if its decimal can be written down by a machine. So if it's possible for a machine to write down those numbers, then that number is computable. But a very interesting part here is that he has shown that the computable numbers are enumerable. The real numbers are not. That must mean that there are real numbers that no machine can ever compute. And he goes further because he starts digging into what are the sort of the philosophical aspects of this. What about us humans? Can we compute any such numbers? Are humans Turing machines? Are the numbers that we humans can compute that such a machine could not? Now, this sparks a big philosophical debate at the time where Turing argues that, yes, we are Turing machines. We have the same limitations as, uh, as the machine he proposes. Others don't agree with him, and I guess at some point it will depend partially on your view of if there's a diet, there could be some, some extra, uh, extra cost to think about other numbers. But he gives an argument that looks something like this. A human can only have a finite state of mind because two sufficiently similar states would be confused. We can only consider a finite state of mind ourselves. And actually, this is something that we use all the time when we're doing mathematics, or when we're building program for that sake. We need to split it up. We can't have all at once in our head. We have to split it up in order to, to get control of it and, and find a system on how to deal with it. And in terms of symbols, he says that a human can only interpret a finite set of symbols. And two symbols that are sufficiently close would be confused as well. And an example would be this. We can take these two numbers and we, can, we can't decide which one is larger just by looking at it. We have to analyze it, split it up to understand which one of these two numbers is the larger. And if we humans also can only interpret a finite set of symbols and we have a finite set of states to operate on them, then we have the exact same limitation that the Turing machine has. Which means that there are numbers that neither we as humans or a machine can compute them. Now, it suddenly becomes a philosophical question, does such a number even exist? What does that mean? One thing that's interesting to think about are those physical constants we have. How about the speed of light? Gravity constant. Are they computable or not? We don't know. If we're living in the matrix, then they have to be computable, <laughs> which is interesting. If we're not, then it might not. We don't know. But not everybody agreed on this, and Gödel, for one, he did not agree on this limitation, because he stated like this, that the human mind is dynamical, is always changing, and that fact that we are always changing as humans might potentially allow us to treat it as an infinite state machine. This is, of course, a philosophical question, so there's no true or false answer to this, but it's a really interesting thing to think about. <clears throat> now, let's return to his paper again. Because again, this was, neither was this the goal to, to introduce this type of philosophical problems. He was out there to try to prove something about this Entscheidung's problem. And to, in order to continue there, we have to talk about some definitions that he makes in his paper. These are definitions of what he calls the circular and circle-free machines. And there are basically two conditions that will result in a machine being called circular. The first one is that a circle machine it's a circular if it can uh, end up in an undefined state, undefined configuration. So this is a very simple example of one of those. So we start at B. There's no symbol underneath the head. So you print a zero, but we don't move, and then go back to B. At this point, there is a symbol here, but we haven't defined any row for dealing with that state. So this is basically a crash. I guess some of you experience crashes from time to time. It happens. So that's one way to be circular. 
The other way to be circular is to end up in a state where it's impossible to write any more zeros or ones. So this is a simple example of that. We start off from B, there's no symbol under the head, so you move to the right and you go back to B. Here we're never printing anything. We're just moving across the tape without ever printing a, a number. So this is also a circular machine. And this can be thought of as a machine that hangs. So a machine that hangs or crashes, that is a circular machine. If it don't, then it's called circle-free. So a circle-free is a machine, a circle-free machine is a machine that operates correctly, and a, a circular machine is the one that crashes or hangs. Okay. Now we're going to bid, build a rather odd machine. We're going to call this machine H. It's difficult to come up with a better name for it. This is the uh, name that Turing gives it, uh, and it's probably because it comes after G. He was not very good at coming up with names either. So this machine, H, what it does is that we will start by assuming that we have three small machines. First one, circuit-free machines. First one we will call is correct. And the idea is that we, we have our machine at some point and we have a configuration on the tape. Uh, and this machine here will then take a, a number and it will decide whether or not that number is, uh, represents a correct uh, description number. So for instance, any machine, any number that contains a zero won't be a correct description number because zero is not part of, what, of those uh, digits he would uh, include in a description number. Um, and this will then operate on the tape, do some calculations, and in the end it will come up with a true or false answer. And once you've done that, you will erase any notes you've done, and you will be in a state where you have now, you know that it's, this description number is true or false. So that's pretty easy to, well, relatively easy to write. It's a good program exercise if anyone wants to do that. Next machine is one that we call is circle free. And the goal of this machine is to take a description number and decide whether or not that description number represents a machine that is circle free, which means that it doesn't hang and it doesn't crash. That is harder, but we will just assume for now that we have that machine. And finally, we will have a machine called print digit. Print digit takes a description number and an integer or a, a positive number, and what it does is it takes that description number, executes the corresponding machine, and then picks the nth number from that machine. So if you provide one as digit, it will, uh, it will print the first number from that machine, if you provide two, it will the second, and so on. Now, we can start counting, and we will start producing numbers with this machine. So the first number this machine H will produce is the first number from the first cycle-free machine we reach, and then the second number from the second cycle-free machine, and so on. Using pseudocode, this machine could look something like this. So we start off with a description number, zero, and n equals one, n is the, um, how many, which digit of that number we have found that we will, we will print, and we start looping. So we start off with zero. Is zero a correct description number? No, it isn't. So we just increment the description number until we reach a point where we have a description number that is correct, right? Then we need to check if it's circle-free. If it isn't, then we just continue. If it is, then we print the nth digit of that machine, increment n, and so on. All right, so we start counting. Zero, one, two, three, and the first circle-free machine we reach is this one. This is a circle free, or this number here is what is 12 million, 1 million, 233,241. So it's a big number. We have to count for a while, but we got there. And this is a machine that just prints a digit zero on every single square. So the first digit that H will print is zero. Second circle free machine we reach is this one. This is the machine that prints a one on every single square. So the second digit that H prints is one. But we continue. So we reach the third, the fourth, the fifth, and we count on and on and on and on. And finally, we get to a description number for a very interesting machine. Can anyone guess which that is? This age is also described by a table. That means that there must be a description number here that corresponds to this machine itself. 
And what happens when we reach that machine? Well, let's see. So is the description number correct? Yes, obviously it is. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been this machine. Is it circle free? Well, we don't know really, right? But let's assume it's not. It's not circle free. It can crash. It can hang. All right, then we just continue. We have the next description number, and we continue writing our zeros and ones. But we continue writing our zeros and ones indefinitely. That means that it is circle free. So is circle free has to be true for this machine. So now what happens if we assume that it's true here? So again, we come to this description number. It is uh, correct, and it's circle free. All right, so we go in here. Now we're going to print this digit. And if you remember what this function did, it took that description number, executed it, and printed the nth number from that machine. So let's say the, this machine is the 10th digit or 10th uh, circle free machine we find. It's probably more like a one trillionth or something like that. But let's say it's a 10th. What well, would happen then? Well, we reach this point. So now we start executing this machine. We want to print the 10th number. That means we have to print the first number, second number, third number, and so on until we reach a 10th number. But we want to print the 10th number for this machine. So we reach this part. And we have to start all over again. So you have to count from 1, 2, 3, 4, and 10, ah, and you have to start over again. Which means we can never print anything. If this one is circle free, then it can't be, because we can't, we can't print the number, number 10. So what happened here? We proved first that it can't be false, but now we just prove it can't be true either. So how is that possible? This is a paradox. What did we do wrong? Well, paradoxes comes from us making some form of wrong assumption. And the assumption we made in this case was that it's possible to define this function is circle free. We know that the others two can, we can write those. Those are not hard, but we assume that. And that assumption led to a paradox, which means that the assumption must be false. It is not possible to define a function that checks whether or not a Turing machine always uh, works correctly. That is impossible. This is a proof by contradiction. He assumed something and it led to a contradiction, which means that the assumption must be false. And another version of this that we use in computer science is this um, uh, halting problem. It is not possible to write a, a program that takes any other program as input and decides whether or not that program, uh, program will complete. You just can't do it. You can, of course, find sub-programs sub that you can analyze and find, but you can't, cannot find that general solution to that problem. So Turing's conclusion is pretty much that H can print neither 0 nor 1 for its own description number, which means that the assumption must be wrong. And you remember the entscheidings problem, which was the goal of trying to find out whether or not it was possible to decide whether or not the problem was provable or not. He is able to use this finding to show that this is not possible. It is not possible to find such a mechanism. Because if such mechanism exists, that must, means, must mean that this is circle free program must exist, and it doesn't. And that is sort of the final stake in the heart of Hilbert's program and his ideas around this. Because this is a proof that even that part is impossible, beyond our reach. All right. During about the same time, there's another mathematician operating at the other side of the Atlantic in the US. His name is Alonzo Church. And he developed something he calls lambda calculus. Actually, the basis for functional programming, for those who are interested in that. But he published in 1936 a paper called An Unsolvable Problem of Elementary Number Theory. And a little later, he publishes a note on this, where he says a note on the Einstein's problem, where he basically comes up with the same proof that Turing did, but with a very different mecha mechanism. That note was released on April 15th, and Turing's paper was submitted on May 28th. That's a month and a half later. So Turing was basically scooped. 
Alonso, Alonso, uh, <clears throat> Alonso Church got there first, which of course in science is a hard thing if the one that is first gets the honor. And this, uh, during his supervisor at this point, he, um, he contacted the, uh, the, pu the publishers who were go going to publish his paper and said, hey, I have a student here that's going to be absolutely crushed by this result, uh, but I, I beg you to, to take into consideration his, uh, his paper anyway, because he's using a very, very novel technique. And they did, with a um, condition. And the condition was that Turing had to prove that the result that he came up with, with his Turing machine, was equivalent to the ones that Alonso Church came up with, with his calculus. So we did that, and that paper was approved and um, published in August, same year. But it was quite obvious that these two persons had a lot in common, that they were working on problems of, of a similar uh, dignity and in, in the same area. So they actually started working together, and uh, Turing moved to the US and studied under Alonso Church in the US at Princeton University there, uh, and actually took his PhD under Alonso Church. That pretty much settled it for the, for the Turing machine, and uh, what happens afterwards is that uh, Turing, after taking his PhD, he moves back to the, uh, to the UK, he moves back to Britain in 1938, just before the war starts, and uh, he quickly came involved in the code-breaking uh, operations of the, uh, um, of the British government, I'm sure you have all heard of that, and the Enigma and all of that, which is one of the really interesting parts of his career as well, how he broke that uh, uh, that coding mechanism, but uh, that's nothing I can go into in going into here. But he built the machine, or participated in, led the work on building that machine that cracked the German um, uh, crypt cryptographic uh, engine called Enigma. After the war, he participated in building the first real computer. That was the first instance of a machine that would actually accomplish what uh, that fict fictitious Turing machine could do. And he worked on that, it was called the ACE, the Automatic Computing Engine, and it executed its first program 10th of May 1950. And the program was, of course, written by Alan Turing. And Turing became the world's first computer programmer at this point. Some people would argue that there were earlier people, Charles Babbage and such, working on mechanics, but this was the work machine that actually worked, and it was actually running real programs. How about Hilbert? Well. The end of his life was sort of sad, actually. He, was, uh, he stayed in Germany during the war. Um, and uh, once the Nazis came to power in 1933, things got really hard in the uh, university world. And one of the things was that Jews were not allowed to teach anymore after Hitler came to power. And at one point, Hilbert ended up uh, next to the uh, German uh, minister of, um, of education, obviously in the Nazi government. Um, and he got the question from this German minister, about how is mathematics at Göttingen now that you are free of the Jews? And the reply was that mathematics at Göttingen there is really not anymore. Because the intellectual uh, world was being shattered by, uh, by how the Nazis struck down on this and their focus on sort of the Nazi um, ideology on this. Later, Hilbert himself became under suspicion of being a Jew, how that can be... Uh, um, possibility, but uh, partially due to his name, from what I understand. David is sort of a traditional Hebrew name, uh, and he came, fell out of, um, uh, of grace with the Nazi regime. And he dies in 1943, middle of the war, 81 years old. And his tomb can be found in the city of Göttingen, where he operated as a, as a professor, where, it, where he was teaching. And it's interesting to see this tomb. You can actually visit it now. I've never been there, but I would like to go there. At the bottom of the, the tombstone, there's an inscription and the description is his quote, wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. We must know, we will know. Which summed up his philosophy on what mathematics is. The world of mathematics was very, very different from what Hilbert originally thought it was. But he definitely spurred some very interesting ideas. And here we are now today in a conference totally dedicated to what is basically the ancestors of what Turing was doing there in the 1930s. Thank you very much.